Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, if you, you know, today's session is uh, going to be related to the export import policy. I plan to cover some of the documentation for exports. And, uh, you know, documentation is a very, very high skill area. And if you have poor documentation skills, you can lose money in international marketing. So it's not about selling, it's also about getting the money. So as an export manager, which is uh, who's responsible for different countries, it's also your job to get money. And therefore, it's not just that you have made shipment to Latin America, Brazil, etc. And then if the money doesn't come, then you are going to be held responsible. And therefore, it is very, very important. This lecture is going to be very important. First, we understand what are the export-import policy. You know, we have done the course. The division has been done in two parts. One is we are talking about the marketing concepts and the global brand building concepts. And in the first module, you have taken the successful international brands operating in India. What you did not still make out was how the legal part of the pestle environment and the economic part of the pestle environment for India is impacting the business architecture these brands have created in India to create cost leadership. Okay, So how the trade barriers, the tariff and the non-tariff barriers, they play a very important role for creating market share in a target market. So whether you will do it through direct sales or whether you will do it through technology tie-ups, you do licensing of technology, or whether you set up a shop, whether you do a 100% subsidiary, or whether you do a joint venture with a local partner. So those are very key decisions for you to generate wealth in a target market. And the legal environment of the target market plays a very big role. And Whatever we are going to be now studying about India is also applicable to any country in the world. So every country has an export and import policy, which is pretty much similar to, you know, in terms of the pillars of export, import policy, etc. Uh, similar to the Indian, you know, uh, some things may be missing here or there, but, uh, you know, the, the strategies and the policy, let's say the pillars are not very different. Pretty much, if I was to uh, just make me a co-host, Anaga, so that I can share my screen. Oh, yes, sir. So, uh, you know, most of the countries, as I told you earlier, you know, prior to 2016 was free movement of goods and services across the world. WTO was encouraging that uh, people give access to their domestic market to international players. The aim was that the international consumer should benefit from the cheapest prices, which will happen only when there is free market access. So that means that manufacturer who is cheapest in the world, if he got the free access to the markets, then obviously he'll be the cheapest. And therefore the international consumer will benefit from cheaper purchase. So this thing went on for almost three to four decades prior to 2016. And uh, the developing countries, they had the benefit that they were allowed to give uh, controlled market access. So they were okay with, you know, some customs duties as a barrier to free access because every developing country wanted that protection against very cheaper imports. They did not want to give free access to their market. So India was also allowed, but with an agreement that there would be a phase decrease of the customs tariffs so that eventually, uh, you know, there should be zero tariff uh, after the domestic industry that becomes competent. Now, with that kind of uh, mindset, WTO operated and whenever there were, uh, you know, new budgets were coming, new foreign trade policy was coming. Earlier, the Indian 
trade policy was for five years and then every year they would review and you know looking at the protection that was needed for the indian industry the uh, customs tariffs were being decided and then wto would review and you know complain and say hey you need to not subsidize your exports because india was also having subsidy on exports uh, most developing countries have subsidy on exports because they want to have more and more foreign exchange earning for the country we did in the last lecture study what is the importance of uh, trade deficits and why it is important that countries export earnings and the import requirement of foreign exchange should be almost similar right if it is not then your local currency comes under pressure and there are various reasons how uh, the local currency also comes under pressure and keeps devaluing so those uh, we studied in the last lecture now uh, today we will study what is the latest export import policy of india what is it saying because in the year in the year 2023 that is last year the new export import policy was declared and uh, i'm just going to now take you to my screen and you will be able to see the screen in a minute yeah so you can see my screen can you see the presentation hello please respond anaga yes sir it is yes sir yeah please please respond quickly okay just one person is enough i just want to make sure because i am operating from a hotel here in uh, vietnam okay so let me see if i can open this no let's go and i hope uh, here it is there it is so i'm just going to go you can see my screen i'm just going to go through the salient features this is the latest as you can see it is september 21st 2023 right so here uh, this is also called foreign trade policy is regulated by the foreign trade development and regulation act 1992 the dgft directorate general of foreign trade is the governing body concerning the exim policy of india i'm just introducing now these departments to you and you will have to keep track later on because these this policy keeps the different aspects they keep introducing removing etc etc okay uh, very important for you to understand that every country will have an exim policy which is similar okay and it works uh, more or less similarly and uh, so let's let's just very quickly go through this the exim policy contains guidelines governing the imports and exports of products and services both exim policy's primary objective is to regulate and develop foreign trade by facilitate facilitating imports into the country and exports from india same thing you know when you're studying the pestel of any target market for your assignment 2 you will have to study the exim policy so it is also going to be regulating imports into that country and exports into that country which i already told you will impact the business architecture design for a particular brand operating in that country or selecting that country for exports so the foreign trade development and regulation act 1992 provides for indian government to announce the exim policy every 5 years each exim policy announced by the indian government is valid for 5 years and they can amend enhance or add new provisions to the policy every year on 31st march taking effect from 1st april as we are talking right now the, there would be some meetings happening which are going to be impacting some policy provisions based on the feedback from the industry that so this policy is very fluid it, it is continuously under review why because the objectives are to facilitate imports and 
exports from India. The Ministry of Finance, in collaboration with DGFT, its network of regional offices, there are every state has an office, and you know the feedback goes because every state has industry, so every industry will have some comments, etc., some problems. So they keep on giving feedback on what the policy matters are good, what are not good, what need to be changed. So this way, the the policy is also under review continuously by the Union Minister of Commerce and Industry. He announces amendments or changes to the exim policy of India from time to time through notifications. So this is what you have to understand. So when you are in let's say, manage, managing the export-import business of any company, you've got to keep looking for the relevant notifications that impact your business. That is what is important. So in 2004, the Exim policy was renamed the Foreign Trade Policy to provide a comprehensive approach to foreign trade in India. The Ministry of Commerce announced the recent FTP, which came into effect on 1st April 2023, FTP 2023 to 2028. So that means up to 2028, we have this policy now in print and which is continuously being reviewed, etc., so what it does, it seeks to make India an export hub and to integrate India further into global value chains. It creates an enabling ecosystem for exporters, which aligns with India's vision of becoming Atman Nirbhar. Okay, so self-sufficient India. Objectives of the policy. Now, these are some objectives. Now, every policy which is detailed in the policy handbook will be trying to reach this goal to increase growth in exports and imports in India, to stimulate long-term economic growth by expanding access to components, intermediates, essential raw materials, consumables, and capital goods. What is important here? You tell me. What are, what are they talking about? What is the most important part of this second policy anyone roll number 14 please come on the line i want to see you on the video roll number 14 there in the class i'm audible sir yes yes sir so yes. Uh, so the uh, second uh, policy is basically uh, to stimulate long-term economic growth by expanding access to components, intermediaries, uh, intermediaries, uh, essential raw materials, consumables, and capital uh, goods. So basically, what they are trying to achieve over here is that uh, right from the start of the economy, whatever is uh, applicable to the very uh, basic starters of it, uh, that will be covered under this particular policy. No, what is what is important? What is important in this? Uh, sir, long-term economic uh, growth. How? Roll number 16. Read this policy. There is something very significant in this. And that is what significant today the world over. Can, can it be said that we'll get the items at a cheaper cost? Yes. You'll get what at the cheaper cost? These components, access to components and raw materials. So that is why we also signed this free trade agreement. With lot of so what is what is really important is that finished goods are missing here. If you read it carefully, it's not talking about finished goods. It's talking about basic raw materials and components to add value to manufacture finished goods. It's not saying that import of finished goods. That is what is significant. Okay, so. To stimulate long-term economic growth by expanding access. So what is it trying to promote? Manufacture made in India. Right? It's promoting value addition. Okay? In India by importing the basic raw materials. That is what is significant. Now, this trend is happening world over. Why? Because every country wants to know the new trend after 2016. What the people want? They also want Atmanirbhar. Every country is looking for Atmanirbhar, self-sufficient. So they are looking at manufacturing the essentials, whatever they need in that country. And the benefit is they want to create employment. 
because what happened by promoting free trade of goods and services and free flow of goods and services and free access to markets was that the export the, they exported jobs overseas so the local people did not get paid very well or they were underemployed or unemployed because cheaper goods were getting imported so now this is a significant change what is happening world over everyone every country is trying to stimulate long term economic growth by expanding access to basic raw materials and capital goods and capital flow so money is also welcome people are also welcome country like korea japan you know because of the aging population they are also opening up immigration so very skilled people are going from again from india and uh, mainly india and china to these countries and going for employment different kind okay just the way it was happening earlier in us and uh, uk and africa now coming to the third is to improve agriculture service and industry competitiveness create new employment opportunities and encourage attaining internationally accepted quality standards so agriculture is also the main focus and service and industry competitiveness they want to improve so like your point that you can have free access to cheaper raw materials that will create competitiveness right and creating new employment of course we talked about the next is to supply high quality goods and services at an affordable cost again talking about competitiveness to encourage economic expansion by providing access to necessary raw materials capital goods installations consumables intermediate production essential elements for expanding production and providing services to improve technological productivity and potency potency of indian agriculture services and companies thus enhancing competitiveness power while creating employment possibilities and to accomplish globally acknowledged quality norms to supply consumers with fine condition services and goods at globally competitive rates right so when you are getting raw materials and components at globally competitive rates if your labor and value addition you are competitive you should be able to create a globally competitive industry at which will be able to create cheaper goods and services for world markets that is the basic goal of ftp right now features of exim policy you now these are some basic pillars for the exim policy 2023 here they are talking about process reengineering and automation so a lot of procedures have gone online and uh, there are uh, schemes like epcg the full form of epcg is export promotion capital goods scheme now i want you to understand this scheme very well you want to make notes you make notes but there are a lot of youtube videos and if you just did uh, google search you will know i will just explain the basis export promotion capital goods that means the government will allow import of capital goods why import of capital goods they are allowing because they know that we want latest technology for producing products and latest technology may be available outside of india and if it is available outside of india in the form of machines then those machines we should be able to import into india without payment of duty so that we give we create competitiveness cost competitiveness as long as the goods produced from these machines are for international markets so that is the underlining condition understood by importing these machines and by not paying duty you have to take on export obligation and export obligation there are different parts of epcg there is a 0% epcg then there is a 3% concessional duty epcg under which you get to export so see if you are getting 0% then what is the revenue loss that the government is making the government calculates okay 20% is the tariff 
So if you have imported capital goods worth 100 rupees and 20% is the tariff, that means government is not charging you 20 rupees of customs duty on the import of capital goods, machines. So government has foregone 20 rupees. The government says, okay, I will forego this provided you earn foreign exchange by using these machines which are maybe six times of this 20 rupees. So maybe 120 rupees you need to earn in foreign exchange by producing goods for export market. And this foreign exchange, they will tell you, you earn in maybe six years or eight years. So those things keep changing. you got to see what is applicable in a certain year. Is that clear? So that is the export promotion capital goods scheme. If you have questions, please ask. Raise your hand, stop me and ask anytime. So this is regarding import of machines at 0% duty for export production. The second you see here is advance authorization. Now what is advance authorization? You don't only need machines, you also need raw materials. So if you need any raw material from any country other than India for export production, see the underlying condition for 0% duty is you must manufacture and earn foreign exchange. You must manufacture for export production. So any raw material components needed for export production, you don't have to pay duty as long as you are exporting the products by adding value to it. And there is a value addition norm also, which you can do Google search and you will find, I think it is 25% or something. You must add 25% value. But this also keeps changing. Uh, I think it's currently 25%, but we can check. Okay. So is this clear? So EPCG and advanced authorization, these are two ongoing very important schemes under the FTP 2015-20 will be continued. They were introduced in 2015. They are continuing and their effectiveness along with technology enablement and substantial process re-engineering for facilitating the exporters. Process re-engineering is basically you have to apply for a license and then, you know, earlier you had to physical this thing. Now everything is happening on digital. So everything is, you know, made very, very easy. So that is what they're talking about process re-engineering. Am I clear? Have you understood this clearly? You need to be aware of this because tomorrow if you are manufacturing in India, for example, you join any company that you have studied, it is Apple or it is, uh, you know, you have to manufacture iPhones in India and uh, components are imported from China. Now what the government is doing? They are allowing import of components for let's say Apple 16. They will be making in India. The components are coming from China, Taiwan, maybe America, some chips, etc. They will be allowed for imports without payment of duty as long as Apple uses India to produce these finished uh, iPhones for the world market and earns foreign exchange. So as long as it does that, there will be no duty. But if it is going to sell them in India, to the extent the components are used for sale of finished products in India, the duty will be there. Whatever is the duty under the tariff, uh, you know, under the FTP of that. Every year, the duties change, etc. So whatever are the duties, they will be applicable for domestic sale in India. Is this understood? If not, please raise your hand. Okay. Very important because these are the things that you have not been able to study in assignment one because you are not aware that what are the FTP parts that really promote investment in India and why more and more companies are looking at investing in India using India as a base for manufacturing for other markets which will earn foreign exchange for the company in India, right? Sir, uh, I have a doubt. 
yes please thank you for asking question yes so is it always better to have uh, my sourcing locations different sourcing location across countries because uh, due to uh, the geopolitical events like russia ukraine war and also due to the pandemic uh, a lot of disruption in my supply chain has occurred yes so the answer so how, to your how, question is how yes how to tackle this situation ideally you know it's uh, not just the ukraine war even before that covid has taught very bitter lessons to the world and uh, you know fortunately for india uh, china suppliers misbehaved during covid and they really made the world uh, blackmailed in a way that they raised the prices etc everyone had almost 90% of their eggs in china's basket so what has been the learning as a result of that which is the same learning for ukraine russia war or is a learning forever and uh, is really benefiting india in a very big way is that every buyer in the world particularly us which was a major importer right europe also they are looking at india as a second source so japanese in fact clearly telling i am going to japan now so meeting some very very important customers they want to meet to see that how they can shift some of the products they were buying from china over to india so in my own business there are more than uh, i would say 30 plus products that i am working on which are the monopoly of china but now the japanese the koreans the americans they are looking at establishing another source in india even if it is a little bit expensive so they do not want to depend on china now that's the strategy world over people are following yes of uh, course and, and i will, also yeah we will have to match the chinese prices too at the end but uh, uh, even if we don't match maybe 5% to 6% price differential we may not get say more than 30% of the business but they know that there is another possibility and tomorrow if china increases prices they can buy more from india yeah uh, so just to one more question uh, yeah. so uh, most of the pharma companies source their apis from china they are over dependent no, on them no, no 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 not apis raw materials for apis yeah some uh, so, apis uh, also yeah. come from china few yeah. apis See wherever in pharmaceuticals, uh, there is a let's say biotechnology based reaction, enzymatic reaction, which are being done in a very very controlled environment. So the cost of energy, you know, they have advantage because they have a very low temperature. These temp these reactions happen at a very low temperatures. Okay, zero to eight degrees. in india if you have to do the same reactions you have to have very very powerful air conditioning system so what happens the cost of production goes up in india right so the, these reactions they do in parts of china which are very very cold india also has cold regions but we have not taken trouble to strategically develop these industries in those regions that's the reason you know the one of the very popular api which most of you must have consumed is uh penicillin ampicillin amoxicillin uh, these are apis where china is very competitive very low why because the cost of energy in india to produce these items is very very huge and china manufactures therefore at a very very large scale and their cost of production is very so only those apis are imported into india but india mind you now does because of this ftp that you have seen instead of importing the apis even in this area the major raw materials they import and then they make the downstream products using those raw materials so now in api industry i just want to correct you most of the importers the raw materials for apis which also after covid indian pharma industry is working very hard after suffering at the hands of the chinese suppliers a lot of raw materials are today 
India is having the capability to manufacture, is manufacturing also. But if China is cheaper, under the advanced authorization scheme, which you just, we import. Because if as long as China is cheaper, we can import. If China increases the price, we can manufacture ourselves. So we have created capabilities in the domestic industry and that process is on. We are not fully there yet. We are maybe 25%, 30% only is there. But there are lots and lots of other raw materials for APIs and pharmaceutical industry, which India is heavily dependent on. But what has happened is that the Chinese manufacturers have understood that if they misbehave now, then Indian industry very much has the capability to manufacture overnight. And India has a big market. We are similar. Maybe we have overtaken China in terms of population. So our market size is very big. And if we stop imports from China, we don't care anyway. Even if we import raw materials from China and sell the finished goods in the domestic market, custom duty has to be paid. Custom duty is avoidable only if we export. So India will consume Chinese raw materials as long as we are exporting. But for our domestic production, we care a hoot because tariff barriers will balance out the domestic cost of production with cheaper imports. Yes, I okay. got it. Carry on with your question. So I just wanted to correct you there. On the pharmaceutical. Uh, yes, I yeah. got clarified most. I just wanted okay. to ask how companies in India have tackled that situation. Like, so I hope I have answered uh, that. Yes, yes, yes. You are. Yeah. In fact, going forward, right, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, if you want to know, China is now changed its policy. US and China may be at war in public. But U.S. does not want India to really become very strong in pharma sector because Indians are threatening the American multinationals. So U.S. plays double games. Today, as we speak, the U.S. FDA is training Chinese FDA okay, in the regulatory practices. So Chinese are asking what we call as drug master files. Okay, which are the detailed manufacturing process for any API. Now, China is a big market. So, and China and Chinese are very smart. What they are asking for is, okay, we are going to give you access to sell your APIs in China. So, China will also, they are following the Indian design of growth of pharmaceutical industry. In fact, Russia is also doing the same. But they don't have technology to manufacture APIs. Now, in pharmaceutical industry, it is a given thing that you have to give out the root of synthesis, how you are manufacturing every step and how you are testing every step in the form of a document which is called a drug master file. Now, these drug master files are registered with the target markets, FDAs. So it is a Bible of how to make API. But it is necessary to give. Now what Chinese are doing, they are collecting all the drug master files from India. Now this is not good for Indian industry. But Indian industry is not understanding they are being lured by way of the getting free access to the Chinese market. So they are giving away their technology in the form of DMFs. For registration and in China, the way they operate is they have big public sector companies. So all the drug master files that they are getting from India, they're using them to manufacture their own APIs. Because if they could supply raw materials cheaper to India and they did not have technology to make APIs, now they are importing drug master files. So these are the non-tariff barriers which I'm talking about. Once you get the DMF for any API, you can manufacture that API. And that's what China is doing. Russia is doing the same. So if you see the growth of Russian industry, and if you see the growth of Chinese industry, at a strategy level, 
they are playing right strategies and policies. And Indian industry is not understanding. Even the Indian government is not. Everybody is thinking that, okay, after registering our drug master file, we will be able to export. That's not going to happen. In fact, some of our traditional APIs, they will start manufacturing, which is our, our strength today. And our strength is also manufacturing formulations, the tablets, capsules. India has the largest number of US FDA approved plants in the world. But that part also is changing in China. So Chinese are playing a very great game. In 10 years, you will see China will cover that gap that they have with India in the pharmaceutical sector. It's a very interesting thing. Keep watching. Okay. Good. Any other question? So, you understand now the how the legal environment and the economic environment is also to be studied for target market, creating volumes in the target market, right? All right. Should I continue? So, now we come into the towns of export excellence. Now, one thing which Modi government has done is that they have recognized that India has so many towns and there are so many different craftsmen and so many local skills that they have which generate competencies and to manufacture products and services. So they have created these towns of ex export excellence. So four new towns, that is Mirzapur, Faridabad, Varanasi and Muradabad are designated as towns of export excellence along with the existing 39, 39 towns. So that means there are 39 more towns plus four, 43 towns are there now. The TEEs, as they are called in short form, have priority access to export promotion funds under the market access initiative. Now, what is a market access initiative? It is only that we are trying to now bring more focus. So now, suppose in you know, in Mirzapur and uh, Mirzapur is an area where, let's say, handicrafts are. There. Now, those handicrafts are exported to which which countries have demand, right? So, market access. So, those countries for those products are also listed, and there are some special incentives given if you export to those countries. Okay. So, this is more about product bringing pro product focus and market focus also and it's called market access initiative scheme they can avail of the common service provider benefits under the epcg scheme for export fulfillment that means if they import any machinery for producing products in these towns then they have faster access right which boosts the exports of handicrafts hand looms and carpets so these are some of those uh, as you can see products and product categories which uh, are made in these particular towns. So that is the towns of export excellence which has gotten added into FTP. Recognition of exporters is the next pillar. Exporter firms that are recognized based on export performance can be partners in capacity building initiatives on a best endeavor basis. Now, what the government has done is they have categorized different exporters. So you have the first is export house, one star, two star, three star, five star, like that. So the more is your export earning, you get so many stars. Now, what it does is that just goes on building your credibility and it goes on facilitating imports without really getting into many details. Later on, audits can take place, but if you want something immediately for import of raw materials, etc., you can just go and file the application based on the receipt of the application. Application is not approved. License is not given. But you are able to import without payment of duty. So more and more facilitation is there. You want to export on 180 days credit, you are allowed. You know, RBI is a little bit because you have already achieved that status. So like, so that is what it means. Promoting export from uh, streamlining, uh, promoting export from the dis recognition of exporters, sorry, right? So, more is your turnover, export turnover, the greater is the benefits, facilitation, etc. 
promoting export from the districts. So now, first was the towns. Now what they have done? They are going to the districts. The foreign trade policy aims to build partnerships with state governments and take forward the districts as export hubs. So now they are creating export hubs so that idea is to collaborate and make exports you know, easier and also make funds available for different initiatives easier to these districts. It's all about bringing focus where the competencies exist and creating a conducive environment for exporters who are based there. Right? Next is streamlining SCOMET policy. Now, SCOMET is a short form of specialty chemicals, special chemicals, organisms, materials, equipment, and technologies. They are actually having both applications. They can have the applications which are destructive for war applications also. And they can have peaceful applications also. Right? For example, now drones. Drones can be used for peaceful as well as they can be used for defense, for military applications. So there is a now SCOMET policy. So there is a broader outreach and understanding of the SCOMET among stakeholders. The FTP is being made more robust to implement international agreements and treaties entered into by India. A robust export control system would provide access to dual use high end technologies and goods to Indian exporters while facilitating exports of controlled technologies or items under SCOMET from India. Right? So biological warfare, chemical warfare, there are a lot of chemicals which can have uh, both peaceful as well as uh, war uh, applications. Right? So you, the government is making it easier for uh, companies to manufacture those products for exports and you require permissions and the list is there and the SCOMAT which are products are there. Right? And you need a license both for import as well as export. Now facilitating e-commerce export. So government is earlier, you know, the, the, you know, for B2C trade particularly and this is where there's a big uh, uh, boost for our startup ecosystem, you know, where you can also Today, create a website, create some specialty products and market internationally, and you can get all the export benefits under the schemes as we talked about. And the government has now recognized that whatever foreign exchange you earn, you know, that would qualify for uh, export benefits. And the limit has been raised to 10 lakhs of invoice through e commerce. So, uh, FTP outlines the roadmap for establishing e-commerce hubs and related matters such as bookkeeping, return policy, payment reconciliation. So, so sometimes what happens is goods have to be returned. Right? Your goods have some quality problem. So somebody has bought it in London. Now he wants his money back. So again, earlier the FEMA, you know, you could not return the money. Now those things are being facilitated. So you can return someone's money if the goods are faulty. So it's all to facilitate creation of an Amazon kind of business based out of India, right? Big opportunity. Next is the dairy sector is exempted from maintaining average export obligation. Now what happened is in dairy sector, a lot of imports of capital goods took place. But our butter, cheese, etc. was not so competitive. So people have not been able to earn foreign exchange as I said, which was the underwritten condition for importing capital goods at zero duty. So what government is doing is they are making it easier and they are saying and there's an amnesty scheme also which is coming somewhere later. So, okay, if you have not earned the foreign exchange but you have imported capital goods, uh, government is going to take a lenient view on that for dairy sector, also agriculture, right? Facilitation under the Advanced Authorization Scheme. The Advanced Authorization Scheme provides duty-free raw material imports for manufacturing export items and is similar to the Export-Oriented Unit, EOU, and Special Economic Zone, SEZ schemes. Now, what happens in EOU and SEZ is that basically if your manufacturing unit is located in any of these zones, 
then whatever raw material you are importing, it is automatically free of duty. Okay, you don't have to require a special license, etc. But whatever you produce, you have to export. Later on, of course, some 25% of your production government has made it you know, possible that every year you can sell in the domestic market. But if you do, then you have to pay import duty on the raw materials that you've used for domestic sale. So that is what they have done. Okay, the FTP contains certain facilitation provision under the advanced authorization scheme based on interaction with industry and export promotion councils. So basically, it's talking about ease of doing business. Next is merchanting trade. That means trade, trading, not manufacturing. So the exports are also different types. So there's manufacturer, exporter, then trader, exporter, who doesn't manufacture but buys from a manufacturer. And so this is talking about now that segment. Under the FTP, merchanting trade and prohibited and restricted items is possible. So there is a list of prohibited items and there is a list of restricted items. Now for traders, that is also possible. Merchanting trade involves the shipment of goods from a foreign country to another foreign country. That means I can remember I was telling you, was it New York class? Somebody said that I, you have to open office in Dubai. I said no more needed. Because today you can buy from China, ship to Vietnam, which is what I do. A lot of products I buy from China. Invoicing is happening from India. So I get the documents in India. The buyer is based in Vietnam. I sell to Vietnam. Goods never come to India. Goods are directly shipped from China to Vietnam. So this is what they are talking about. Right? So, so that has also been facilitated. <clears throat> it says, merchanting trade involves the shipment of goods from a foreign country to another foreign country without touching Indian ports by involving an Indian intermediary. However, it will be subject to compliance with the RBI guidelines and will not be applicable for items or goods classified in this format and sites list. So, those products which have, uh, you know, war or destructive applications, etc., and are there already on these lists, they will not be allowed. This will allow Indian entrepreneurs to convert places like gift city into major merchanting hubs like certain places in Singapore, Dubai, and Hong Kong. Now, if you know how Singapore prospered or how Dubai prospered or how Hong Kong prospered because of this trading. Now, the government has allowed that trading very much in India. Okay? So, you are free to now <coughs> buy from China, sell to America. So, now there are sanctions. So, there are lots of products Russia is not able to get. Under this scheme, there is a big opportunity. Russians are buying a lot of products from India. All right, so that is also happening now. This is what I was talking about amnesty scheme. The government introduced a special one time amnesty scheme under the FTP 2023 <clears throat> to address export obligation defaults. I told you one is EPCG. So, if people have not been able to meet their obligation under EPCG, so there's an amnesty scheme which is coming in which if they end up fulfilling that there will be no penalty. Right? Because penalties have been huge. This scheme provides relief to exporters who are not able to meet their obligation under the EPCG and advanced authorization scheme and are burdened by interest costs and high duty associated with pending cases. The interest payable is capped at 100% of the exempted duties. Right? So, this is basically it. Now, importance of exim policy. Okay, Very quickly, we'll go through this and this is it. More I would encourage you to read on your own tomorrow when you get jobs because <clears throat> the specific provisions for different industries are different. Okay, But the basic policy remains the same. You just need to understand the policy and then look for what duty, if at all, is applicable to import of any raw material, etc. Et and that would be applicable only for finished goods produced with imported raw materials for domestic consumption. If you are exporting, then no duty applicable. No GST is applicable also on exports. 
if any gst has been charged on raw material there is uh, they call res uh, redemption of duties okay rod tp something like that so all those duties are refunded on export products whatever is the gst component that has become part of your total price or total cost will be refunded by the government so importance of exim policy it emphasizes trade facilitation is just the repeat of okay i'm just going to not read it it's just basically covering everything in a short format any questions so far no okay then let's start the basic understanding of in code terms okay if you have any question please feel free to ask i'm just going to take help from some of the videos and uh, just to explain basically these are some short videos which talk about the most important in code term so here we go if you work in international trade or if you want to start a business importing or exporting goods you need to have a deep understanding of inco terms this is short for international trade terms they are basically delivery terms used in international trade, so both the buyer and the seller are on the same page when it comes to what obligations they each have in regards to shipping the goods to their final destination. In this tutorial, we'll be covering the most recent version, Inco Terms 2020, which haven't really changed much from the previous versions. So let's get started. Now just see International Chamber of Commerce. Okay, that plays a very important role in defining the INCO terms. And when it comes to letter of credit also, which we will be studying today, uh, I'll just introduce the concept today. Uh, international Chamber of Commerce plays a very significant role in international trade. And INCO terms are, this INCO terms 2020 is a document which is brought about by International Chamber of Commerce. In international trade, or if you want to start a business importing or exporting goods, you need to have a deep understanding of INCO terms. This is short for international trade terms. They are basically delivery terms used in international trade. So both the buyer and... So they are the delivery terms. So the goods are being delivered on what terms? That is what. So we want to standardize the terms so that whenever we enter into contract, then we use these terms, so the definition is understood by everyone based on the definition in the INCO terms 2020. Seller are on the same page when it comes to what obligations they each have in regards to shipping the goods to their final destination. In this tutorial, we'll be covering the most recent version, INCO terms 2020, which haven't really changed much from the previous versions. So let's Congress. get started. Shipping goods from one country to another includes several processes. First, the goods would be picked up from the supplier's location and then trucked to a seaport, airport cargo terminal, or a rail terminal, depending on the agreed delivery method. Before being able to leave the country... So remember, from India, when we are exporting, it's mostly by air, it is by sea, but to countries like Pakistan, Nepal, it is also by road. Okay, so if we are in Europe, Germany is exporting from Germany by land to nearby countries, okay, Switzerland, France, Holland, on the other side, Czech Republic, right? So land transport, <clears throat> air transport, and sea transport. Now land you can have by train, you can have by road. Marine transport is by ship. Air transport is, of course, by air. Now, these are the different modes of transport 
तो बिकॉज दे आर डिफरेंट मोड्स ऑफ ट्रांसपोर्ट डिफरेंट डॉक्यूमेंट्स आर जेनरेटेड वेन एवर गुड्स मूव फ्रॉम पॉइंट ए टू पॉइंट बी अ डॉक्यूमेंट इज जेनरेटेड एंड इट इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टू हैव दैट डॉक्यूमेंट एक्यूरेटली मेड सो दैट इट द कस्टम्स क्लियरेंस एट द डेस्टिनेशन पॉइंट इज फ्री फ्रॉम एनी प्रॉब्लम वॉट हैपन्स इज इफ द डॉक्यूमेंटेशन इज नॉट राइट the goods will not be released and goods will be they they will attract demurrage at the point of clearance and demurrage can be very heavy and that can bring you into lot of trade conflicts as to who will pay the demurrage whose mistake it is in the document and therefore when we are having cargo movements the risk has to be mitigated so you have to be very perfect in creating the documents okay and this is a very high skill job and that's why please understand these documents and these in code terms first very well country of origin the goods need to clear customs then travel by air sea or land to their destination country after which they will have to be unloaded clear customs and then truck to their final destination ink so you see the customs clearance is happening at the origin port so when you are exporting from india it will happen at the jnpt port the indian customs are going to see the cargo they are going to inspect the cargo they will check whether what you are saying is the cargo it is indeed the same they will draw out samples so there are pre shipment procedures that will be there in fact customs have a huge laboratory where they send samples they will draw samples at random so if you are exporting and you say oh this is wheat flour then they will take out samples and say okay whether what you are saying is same if you say it is paracetamol then they will draw out sample and they check so they make sure what you have declared in your invoice and what you are shipping is indeed the same okay why that is we will learn about that in a different lecture because a lot of export benefits are related to what you are exporting right so remember that these procedures happen at the time of pre shipment the customs get involved at the point of origin then when the goods reach destination customs get again involved in seeing what has come in and then from where it has come in so there are countries for example if the goods are made in china the import duty today may be higher than india china may in involve 10% duty india may involve 2% duty in, in for example usa this differential duties so a lot of role the customs of each country play in that is to again make sure that the policies relate to exports and policies relate to import of the destination country they are adhered to in the right amount of tariffs are collected okay let's go on so terms covers exactly who will bear the costs and the risks of each process there are several inco terms but we'll be focusing on the ones that matter and are most commonly used F so what is the importance of inco terms these terms define who will bear the cost so first let's understand whether the shipper the exporter will bear the cost or whether the importer will bear the cost so let's understand these in good terms ob cif and cfr are some of the most commonly used terms for sea shipping although many times they are incorrectly used for other modes of transport but let's start with the simplest term which is ex works abbreviated exw this means that the supplier provides no delivery whatsoever so the buyer is responsible for picking up the goods from the supplier's location and organizing transportation to the final destination so on a contract or invoice this term would be written as exw and the city or location where the goods will be available for pickup next there's fob one of the terms most commonly used for shipping by sea fob stands for free on board and it basically means that the risk is transferred to the buyer when the goods are loaded on board the vessel at the agreed port of loading This means the supplier supports all the risks and costs of trucking the goods to the loading port, clearing customs, and all the local port charges associated with loading the goods on the vessel. The buyer is responsible for 
all the remaining costs to the final destination, like ocean freight, destination port charges, customs clearance, and transport to the final destination. The same as all... Is this understood? If you don't understand at any point, raise your hand. Right? So, what is important is, this is the factory, trucking, customs. So here the goods have come to the port. Terminal charges. Terminal charges are the port trust charges. You know, there is the, the, the port authorities. They don't give you free service. So, there are terminal charges. Then the shipping charge, ocean freight. Then at the destination, again, there are terminal charges. So you see these terminal charges, loading, unloading, whatever you know, storage that is happening at the, the, at the export port and at the import port. So there are terminal charges. And then the customs tariffs. And then again, trucking. And then the buyer's warehouse. So this is the scheme of things in which the goods get transported from seller's factory to buyer's go down. Now, when we talk about X-Works, all the costs, trucking, customs, terminal charges, etc., all these are borne by whom? The buyer. When we're talking FOB, here the seller will pay for charges right up to putting the goods on board of the ship. And after that, the ocean freight and of course, other terminal charges, customs, trucking, etc. What is not included here, which normally is included, and I want to know, point that out, is insurance. You know, the sea insurance. Normally, this part, the seller will cover in FOB. Okay? And uh, remind me to, we will be talking about insurance and how to cover insurance. So the goods have to be, if something happens from here to here, right? It should be very clearly understood either the buyer is going to do this insurance or whether the seller will do the insurance. But goods must be covered for insurance. So make sure that that is clear in the contract. Any question? If you have, please raise your hand. I'll stop the presentation at any time. Okay? Thank you. But it's very important that you understand this. Other INCO terms, this would be written on a contract or invoice as FOB and the port of shipment. For example, FOB Shenzhen or FOB Shanghai. CFR and CIF are similar terms. CFR means cost and freight and CIF means cost insurance and freight. In both cases, the seller pays the carriage of the goods to the named port of destination. The only difference is under CIF, the seller has to obtain insurance for the goods while in transit. In both cases, the risk is transferred to the buyer after the goods have been delivered on board the ship. The buyer is responsible for all the local charges at the port of destination, like unloading goods off the ship, local port charges, customs clearance, and transport to the final destination. We're about done with the most commonly used terms for sea shipping, so now let's see two of the most commonly used terms for any type of transport method, DDU and DDP. Let's talk about DDP first, which is delivery duty paid. The seller is responsible for all the risks and costs until the goods have reached the specified place of arrival ready to be unloaded. So the seller handles all the delivery and import formalities and duties to the final destination. This is also many times called door-to-door -door delivery. DDU is an older term from Inco Terms 2000, but it is so popular that it is still being used today. It means delivery duty unpaid, and similar to DDP, it means the seller is responsible for all risks and costs to the place of arrival except import formalities and duties. Since a lot of traders still prefer using this older term in trade documents, it's mandatory when using DDU shipping to mention as per Inco Terms 2000 in the documents. In Inco Terms 2020, the closest term to DDU is DAP, which stands for Delivered at Place. The same as DDU, the seller is responsible for all the risks till the goods have reached the destination ready to be unloaded, except any import formalities and duties. One way or another, delivery terms will affect either product costs or shipping costs. So when negotiating, either with customers or suppliers, it's important to know what delivery terms to choose. So we'll be focusing on that in our next video. Till next time, please remember to like this video. And if you're new to this channel, please subscribe to catch the next okay, Any questions?
okay? So now let's move on to the exports documentation. How much time we have, Anaga? 20 minutes? Uh, sir, the lecture is still nine. So we have an hour left. Oh, okay. No, because 9.40 for me. Uh, we have uh, 9. 9 is 10.30 for me. So we have about uh, 20, 50 minutes. Yes. Right? Okay. I'm just trying to get an idea of there's a time difference. I get confused. All right. So exports documentation. Now, as I told you, that if any of these documents are not properly made, what will happen? What is the risk? Documentation risk. In international marketing. What will happen is that these documents we are going to study, if they are not properly made, remember, your goods will get stuck at the port of destination. And if goods get stuck, they will start attracting, they will be held there. The terminal charges are going to increase because of what we call as demurrage. That means the port will hold your goods, but they'll charge you the cost for storing the goods. Now, you have not prepared the documents well. It gets stuck. The customer will not clear the goods on time and you will be charged demurrage. And now, the shipper normally, depending upon the in -court terms, if it is FOB, where does the risk get transferred? Rule number 18. In FOB, where does the risk get transferred? Rule number 18 there in class? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. So in case your contract to deliver is on FOB terms, where does the ownership of the goods get transferred to the buyer? What's difficult? Were you listening to the past presentation? Yes, sir, I was present, yeah. And I told you, if you're not understanding, please raise your hand. What is it that you not understood? What is FOB standing for? The free on board. Free on board of what? Board of what? Do you remember that slide? Anyone? Rule number 20. Class participation, you, you know, uh, Anaga, I will uh, be giving, yes, sir. I, am, I am making a note of all these people who are not able to answer. So you will, you will see it in your internal marks. So please stay attentive. I am evaluating you when I ask you questions. Yes, roll number 20. Where does the ownership of goods get transferred to the buyer in case of FOB contract is the question. Roll number 20. Uh, sir, it gets transferred to the buyer when when the um, when it's uh, off coded uh, on the designated location, that's where... Uh, when it is onboarded. Out. When it is onboarded on the vessel. On the vessel, yeah. When the goods are onboarded on the vessel at the port of loading. Yeah. Okay. Now, anything uh, that goes wrong after that is not shippers or exporters' responsibility. Yeah. Right? So, if yeah. any document that gets created after that is not proper, that is seller's responsibility. Right? Thank you. 
so please stay attentive these are going to be part of your job the government of india has set a target under ftp to reach 2 trillion dollars in exports so regardless of which industry you are going to be joining in there is going to be dearth of people with skills relating to this because there are not enough mba schools who are teaching this skill and this is your time to understand and become experts and you will see that will impact your growth in the organization so please do not sit quietly if you don't understand raise your hand okay in case of cif rule number 26 when does the ownership of goods get transferred to the buyer rule number 26 rule number 26 present anaga Okay. Okay. Quickly, I will need your answer. Roll number twenty-six. Who's it? Oh, uh, it's Aniket Mal. Aniket Mal Dekar. Aniket is there. Okay. Let him make. the summary of today's lecture on uh, sir he was there in the screenshot that was taken at the start of the lecture yes yeah, sorry 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 just put him put him assignment today's lecture he has to make detailed word by word file and submit okay roll number 36 it will be from the uh, buyer's port from there it will be the responsibility of the buyer once it arrives at the uh, so that is called destination yes. port that is called destination port yes. okay thank you and in case of ddu where will the ownership buyer buyer port but uh, the custom clearance will be under the buyer ddu good very good very good okay roll number Forty-three. Yes, sir. In case of DDP, uh, in case of DDP, uh, it will be delivered till uh, the trucking period. Uh, it was door to door delivery. Door to door delivery. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So, any anyone has any doubts? Please ask me because this is very important. uh the contracts you know every big transaction in international marketing happens through contracts so now i'll give you the actual case study okay let's talk about some stories actual stories it happened from my I'll, i'll take out so we had a chemical which we were shipping it was hazardous and it was uh, flammable uh so what happens in case of chemicals you have you are governed by the different uh, you know rules which are uh, international maritime dangerous goods code i am dg codes are there uh, hazard classifications are there different goods with different classifications require different kind of packaging so there's indian institute of packaging that conducts the tests of the packages in which these hazardous goods are packed they give certification which is approved by the imdg international maritime dangerous goods code people so they do different testing to see that the packages that are used for packing of these goods they are safe enough for the transport of the goods so in chem in the in the chemicals you know there are different kind of chemicals there could be flammable chemicals there could be uh, chemicals that can be poisonous there could be chemicals that are highly uh, you know ero erosive chemicals different kind of chemicals 
so this particular product was hazardous and it could catch fire if the temperature reached 46 degrees now of course the goods were packed in the containers which were approved by indian institute of packaging so there was a un number they give okay it's called un number for hazardous goods and that number is actually engraved on all the drums so they were about 50 uh, 50 kg drums and the material was 16 metric tons so i think about uh, whatever was the number of containers in a container uh, number of drums in a container the contract that we entered we must have shipped more than 1000 tons on cif europe Lee Havre was the port. I hope that all of you have tried and studied the major ports in the world. Lee Havre is a major French port. The buyer was in France and that was his port nearest to the factory. So he was using that. And more than 1000 tons we had shipped on CIF basis. Which means that all the risks were on our account till the goods reached Lee Havre port in France. Now, we went into negotiations and buyer said that, okay, how much is the freight you are charging? You give me your FOB price as well as CIF price. We entered into a 100 metric ton contract again and uh, 96 metric ton to be precise because one container was 16 metric tons no 8 metric tons and uh, so buyer somehow said that oh I am getting a very cheap freight so I don't want you to give me a CIF price your FOB price is more attractive to me so we said fine we entered into an FOB price contract as luck would have it, this container was put on board in Mumbai. From Mumbai, it sailed to Colombo. Colombo, it was transshipped onto another vessel. And that vessel took the cargo to European port. I don't know where it was meant to be. But as it was nearing Europe, the ship caught fire. And of course, when the ship catches fire, it was nearing Italian port of Genoa. They called up Genoa port and the ship was immediately in emergency, taken to Genoa port, the fire brigade, etc. All the people came, they doused the fire. And later on, the investigation re revealed that it was our container which was kept near the engine room. And you know, if the container is kept near the engine room for some reason, the temperatures are high. And of course, it reached 45 degrees, maybe. And our container caught fire first. And then there were containers around us, which were also maybe textiles or whatever. So they caught fire and the, almost 50% of the ship was destroyed. Now, in this case, what should happen? Legally. Now, this is where I want your competencies to grow because if you could be the person entering into these contracts, depending upon the nature of the material that you are exporting, right? So, in chemicals, there's something called material safety data sheet. So whenever you are exporting hazardous goods, the chemicals have material safety data sheet. It gives you the entire configuration, the properties of the chemical, how it behaves, how hazardous it is, what you should do, etc. I will show you the material safety data sheet shortly. Okay. Now, the fact of this case is the shipping company, they raised a claim 
amounting to $10 million. The invoice value of the cargo was only maybe $60,000. That was the worth of the cargo. But the destruction that it caused and the, the claim that it that we received from the shipping company, because the cargo belonged to us, was $10 million. In today's terms, it would be close to eight and a half, no, 85 CR. For a cargo, which is maybe 50 lakhs worth, 85 crores. And if you are the export manager, and if your company has to pay this, now you can imagine what will happen to your job. Right? That's the reason why the importance of getting these skills. So what argument we should take? Role number 42. Sir, uh, I think, is there any insurance involved uh, you can claim on that? Now, the role of insurance. What kind of insurance? Sir, uh, what does insurance cover now? You are the insurance company. What insurance you cover? Uh, I think the insurance would cover uh, the entire cost of from the finished goods that it the, only that, the finished goods only yes. the finished. so in this case sixty thousand dollars okay right oh, yeah so remember what risks you are covering through insurance normally when you're talking about logistics insurance it's only going to cover the cost of goods okay it's not going to cover third party claims damages right and if you want to cover $10 million of third-party claim, which is possible, the insurance premium that you'll have to pay, you cannot do business with. So you understand? Yes, sir. What are we trying to learn? The risks for goods movement in international marketing. And how to mitigate those risks. So, did we mitigate that risk? Uh, somewhat through insurance, yes. We did. No. Insurance doesn't mitigate the risk in this case. We yeah. only, we only, in this case, the contract was what? What was the INCO term in the contract? CI. No. What did I say in the entire story? It was not CIF. What did I say? The customer changed the contract from CIF to FOB because he was getting a good freight deal. Were you listening? Yeah, yeah. So, so it was an FOB contract for us. So where does the ownership of goods get transferred in FOB contract? Uh, at the port, when the goods are uh, being shipped on the ocean, loaded, loaded on the vessel, or loaded on the vessel. yeah, to learn to say the things the way they are. Okay, so our risks were only up to the loading of the vessel. After that, all risks were on the by by the car. So that was the point of defense. And then what happens when they saw? The risks are on the buyer's account. They went to the buyer. Now, what will the buyer do? What happens in real life? Uh, the buyer will try to protect his interest. How? See. So, what argument now? You are the buyer. What will you say? Which can happen in real life tomorrow. Huh? <laughs> you could be in the buyer's seat. What will you uh, be your argument? Uh, I'll try to push it on you only in some way. Oh, try oh, to find oh. a legal way to uh, oh. try. Oh. Uh, I'll try to find some legal way where I could see if I could uh, make some how? claims on the seller itself. How? How? My question is how? Use common sense. You don't require any 
you just need street smartness to answer this question how can you pass on the claim to shipper probably it was not maybe claim in. yeah maybe Sorry. claim it as ci instead of FAB. no you cannot change in code terms so first understand that's where the in code terms are important the contract terms are important if fob you have entered into a contract and everything is fob your invoice says fob you cannot change cif so please understand that these are now written in stone the terms are written in stone you cannot change that yes so uh, yeah who was answering you mentioned right that the, the place where it was uh, loaded it was not the right place or that was near the engine or something uh well he he can say that and in that case he will be able to pass it on to whom the shipping line and then that, shipping shipping no, line will have to shipping line will have to say protect itself so suppose the now buyer says that okay this container was not kept at the right place so now money has to be recovered the shipping company shipping company will say i am the one raising the claim right you are saying that i did not keep the container at the right place so you prove it so what which document will you go to to prove that I'm not sure which document will be used. Okay. I will show you which document. What did I say? Uh, I can't write. <laughs> Okay, I think it's because of. Okay, material safety data sheet. Okay. Why it doesn't write? Okay. Okay, I'll 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 maybe come back to that a little later. So material safety data sheet. that gives details of the chemical so if i have provided as a shipper material safety data sheet to the buyer and buyer has provided the material safety data sheet and that it would have mentioned that this hazardous cargo can catch fire if the temperature is above 45 46 degrees and if that document has not been provided by the buyer and i have not provided the buyer then i could be held responsible as a shipper but that has to be provided by the seller right because seller is the one who is actually manufacturing you are product. absolutely right so we had provided that and we had proof of providing that to the buyer and also to the shipping company at the time of handover of the cargo so this was given we had proof luckily those is facts used to be there so the facts and the, everything was given and there was correspondence from our shipping our documentation department that we were we had provided and in our export documents that were presented to the bank the material safety data sheet was also part of that and these documents had gone to the buyer so all that was the proof so we again got cleared but the first claim that the supplier the buyer said was it was improper packaging the shipping line came back to us saying it was improper packaging see they want to catch your neck now you have to prove that the packaging was proper so how do you prove the packaging was proper first is probably you know the images are taken before it is once it is no 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 one second one second just just stick to what we learned today what did i say how do you get proper packaging 
for hazardous goods what is the procedure which i just explained for getting the proper packaging for transportation of hazardous goods who do you go to swapnil yeah this time who remember who do you go to Roll number twenty-two. Material safety data sheet. Material safety data sheet is only going to give you the hazardous nature of the product. But for who will you go to ensure that the packaging is proper? What did I mention just now, ten minutes ago? Roll number twenty-two. So, specialized carriers we can uh, take help from. No. Ten minutes ago, I just explained to you. There is an organization that gives the certificate. What it does? Which is that organization? Sheetal, did you make note of it? Uh, Hiral. Sir, I A T A. I A. T A. No. Is Hiral there today? Yes, so, uh, sir, I am not uh, the, the International Chamber of Commerce. No. Okay, make a very careful note again. I'm repeating. Indian Institute of Packaging. They will test the package. And then they will give you a certificate that the package is good enough for that hazardous class cargo. And then each drum that you submit to them for testing, they will be testing it properly. So they have their own ways of testing for different hazardous class cargos. And then they will give you a number which is called UN number which will then be engraved on all those drums that you are going to use for packaging of this hazardous cargo. Right? If you have to mitigate risk while transporting hazardous cargoes, then this number is very important and this number is acceptable to the International Chamber of Commerce in all kinds of conflicting situations. And then that means the packaging is proper and we had that number. Our all drums carried that number. So investigation revealed that the packaging was also proper. The contract was on FOB grounds. The material safety data sheet was given. And the UN number was engraved on all drums. And all the drums were certified by the Institute of Packaging, which were good enough for packing hazardous cargo. Our case still went on for almost two and a half years. And then... Once all these proofs were given, first the case was fought in London. We didn't go to London. We said, here is the proof. So the court was asking for proof. We were submitting to the court from India. We didn't hire a lawyer because we knew we are strong. Our contract was on FOB terms. We had done every part of the due diligence that needed to be done. Then the case shifted to India. They came after us in India. And in Indian court, in Mumbai High Court, it went on. And Mumbai High Court finally gave the decision that the shipper was not responsible. We had taken due care. Eventually, what happened then later on between the buyer and the shipping company, we don't know. We didn't want to find out also. But the, I know one thing. The buyer went bankrupt just a year later. Now, I don't know whether this was the reason. But there were lots of liabilities. Okay, Things didn't come to, we didn't have more information. But I think this indicates learning of risks in goods transport in international marketing, whether you're importing or whether you're exporting. Right? Can we have a very quick uh, attendance, uh, Anaga? Uh, yes, like, sir. Sure. While I continue, while I yes, continue my... Lecture. So, th this is understood, right? All right. Let me...
go on to now the export documentation so the first important document is commercial invoice okay let's see where i have Okay, since the packing slip is there, packing list, let's go to this. Packing list is one of the invoices that gets generated when the cargo is ready for export. So what it contains, here it is called packing slip or packing list, date, customer ID, company name, there is the exporter name, address, etc., everything. Bill to whoever is the buyer, ship to then we, whoever is the you know port of destination, etc. The buyer's clearing agent, order date, order number, purchase order, customer contact, item number, description, order quantity, shipped quantity. So you see that ordered quantity as per the order was 15, but the ship quantity is 13, right. Now, there are more details can come in. It can come, what are the shipping marks on each of the packages? What is the gross weight? What is the net weight? What is the tear weight? Those all details can come in here. Right? So, that is basically the shipping Now, I'm just trying to go back to see. Yeah, here is a commercial invoice. Now, you see the commercial invoice. Here is the exporter name, consignee name. You can see, you can read. Invoice number, bill of lading number. Okay. Bill of lading is a very important document for sea shipments. It should demand draft. If anything goes wrong there, you will not get paid. Reference, buyer reference, buyer if not consignee. Consignee. Now, what is so you understand now there are there could be a buyer and there could be a consignee. Now, in case the buyer is different from consignee, when can that happen? If buyer is a trader. So if buyer is a trader, then the consignee could be different. Right? Consignee would be the actual end user. Whereas buyer is the person who has bought the goods and and the buyer is the person who has paid for the goods but he may be selling at a margin to the actual consignee right so the end user would be different method of dispatch c type of shipment full container load country of origin United States, country of final destination, Australia, which vessel has been used. Each vessel has a voyage number. The moment you put this number, then it will tell you the actual route of the vessel also. Right? Terms, method of payment. 30% deposit balance upon bill of lading. That means 30% advance has been given. 70% they will get when the bill of lading is received. Right, so these are the method of payment, port of lo loading, Long Beach, date of departure of the vessel, fourth July, port of discharge, Sydney, final destination, Sydney. Suppose if it was the buy the buyer's warehouse was not in Sydney, but in Portmouth, then the final destination will be on land. That means 
it will be maybe DDU term or DDP term, right? not CIF term. So here, marine cover policy number also is there. If there's a policy for insurance, letter of credit, not applicable. There's no letter of credit in this case. Product code, description of goods, you see. HS code, unit quantity, unit type, price, amount. Then total value, consignment total, additional information, any in court terms, FOB, Long Beach, currency, USD. This is very important. Dollars could be Australian dollars or American dollars. So it has to be mentioned. Currency is what? Okay. Bank details. Whose bank details are these? These are the bank details where the money has to come. So these are the seller's bank details. And what is very important here is SWIFT code. The SWIFT code, Fedwire outing number, these are the codes which really make money transfer efficient. If these codes are missing in the commercial invoices, then you may not get paid on time. If you do not get paid on time, your job is under attack. So all these things therefore become very, very important for commercial invoice. Any questions? All right. So commercial invoice is understood. Let's go to the bill of lading. What is the bill of lading? A bill of lading is a legal document issued by a carrier, which is a transportation company, in this case, shipping company, to a shipper or exporter. Now, you see, shipper and exporter are same. That details the type, quantity, and destination of the goods being carried. A bill of lading also serves as a shipping shipment receipt when the carrier delivers the goods at a predetermined destination. So, this is a very important document, as I told you. Because based on this, this is like a demand draft, if you want to know. Let's just understand. It's written in French. So this is actually, let me go to another one, which is in English. So you see the shipping company name is given here, Mediterranean Shipping Company, Bill of Lading number is given. This is important here in Bill of Lading original because at the port of destination, only based on the original Bill of Lading can the importer get documents, can, can, can get his cargo. And this original Bill of Lading normally will be in the possession of the bank unless the importer and exporter have a very good relationship and very high trust. The exporter will not hand over this bill of lading directly to the importer. Because the moment this bill of lading is in the hands of the importer, he need not pay for the goods. He can just go to the shipping company at the port of destination to claim the cargo. So this Bill of lading becomes a negotiating document to get your payment. And normally, these documents are sent from the exporter bank to the importer bank. And the bank will release these documents to the importer only after he has paid the money. Okay, so you remember how to secure your payment is 
when the bill of lading the original is sent through the bank you enter into the contract and you mark all the documents to the bank your bank sends those documents to the buyer's bank and you make a covering note that these documents have to be given to the importer only after he makes the payment all right so here <clears throat> what are the details given on a bill of lading so you see the shipper details are there you see the consignee details are there you see the notify party notify party normally will be the clearing agent of the importing company because notify party as the name itself represents is the party who gets notified about the arrival of the cargo and therefore this party has to be the clearing agent who will prepare for the customs clearance of the goods in advance before the cargo comes normally the documents copy go by email these days to the notify party the notify party will then start preparing for all the customs clearance at the port of destination based on the copy of documents but the bill of lading original is very very important without that the importer cannot get delivery of the car that is the importance of bill of lading so here again you see what details you saw in commercial invoice there is a vessel voyage number this port of loading this place of receipt okay in this case this combined transport only c clause 1 and 5 and 10 so here the place of receipt is not the port of unloading as you see this is somewhere else on the land so that means the port the the delivery terms are not cif they are most likely ddu or ddp port of discharge hai phong this is a port in vietnam okay booking reference vessel and voyage number is given container numbers here is the container number with seal number given every container is sealed and the number is given so it says 40 foot container said to contain it says said to contain okay they are not giving a certificate this is what it contains so whatever is the description of the goods is here snm chloramine or whatever 270 drums per 35 kg imo and un number is given right now this is a chemical so you see the un number is there imdg international maritime goods 8 that means classification is 8 the hazardous classification is 8 that means packaging has to be suitable for this hazard classification and un number 1759 has to be engraved on each of the drums and of course there are other things also 3 kg buckets per 3 kg harmless cif this thing terms are given cif vietnam hai phong sales contract number is so and so in kgs so much in cubic meter so much and total tear is 3740 now you see here he says the terms are cif that means the seller has paid only up to cif the whereas here it says the place of delivery is another place right that means all the further charges after haiphong port will be paid for by the buyer is that clear it says freight prepaid and here there are lots and lots of details received by the carrier this is very important to read okay now let's read this carefully because some very important things are going to be coming up received by the carrier in apparent good order and condition unless otherwise stated here the total number of quantity of containers or other packages or units indicated in the box entitled carrier's receipt for carriage subject to all the terms and conditions here in place of receipt port of loading 
etcetera etcetera discharge or place of delivery blah 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 which is applicable in accepting this bill of lading the merchant expressly accepts and agrees to all the terms and condition whether printed stamped or otherwise incorporated on this side and on the reverse side of the bill of lading and the terms and conditions of the carrier's applicable tariff as if they were all signed by the merchant so this itself it's saying is like a contract right whatever are the terms printed they are legally executable so whatever freight has been paid is up to the destination and after that if the place of delivery is different and that freight has to be paid if this is a negotiable to order of now this is what i want you to understand now the bill of lading in this case you see the shipper is his consignee he said this bl is not negotiable unless marked to order or to order of here you see the name of the company was given here the buyer was given vietnam right now what does it mean if in this area of consignee if the name of the buyer is given right then the goods can be taken by the buyer if he is in possession of the original bill of lading if the buyer somehow produces the original bill of lading he can get possession of the goods if the consignee name is mentioned buyer's name is mentioned which you see they they black and they made this white but here the buyer name was mentioned but suppose in case in instead of the buyer name it was mentioned to order and that is what i recommend that your bill of lading should never contain the consignee name and i'll give you a actual story a case study in the next lecture okay to order mean to order of the bank what happens is this, this bill of lading because it's a negotiable document you make it to the order of bank in fact put the bank name here bank whose bank the importer's bank because you are sending bill of lading to the importer's bank with clear instruction that importer's bank should release the bill of lading to the importer after he pays or agrees to pay on a certain date so what happens is when you mark it to the order of behind this bill of lading you will blank endorse what blank endorse means you will say please deliver the goods to you leave blank to whoever the bank orders now this because you have marked consignee as bank now the bank will put the name of the buyer in the blank space above your stamp and sign only and only if the importer has agreed to pay that's what is meant by bill of lading to order of a little difficult to understand if you have not understood i will explain again has everyone understood this what is a to the order of what is the difference between to order of and a bill of lading which is consigned to a buyer what is the difference have you understood if you not please tell me anaga if you have understood then i think everyone's understood no sir i would want you to explain it i am a bit confused there you know the consignee who is the consignee what is the meaning of consignee if you don't know say don't know don't let's not waste time it's okay what's the meaning of consignee do you know 
uh, sir to whom the goods are basically being shipped to so he is the owner of the goods yes, provided the he makes the, the payment provided yeah. he makes the payment he yes, will become provide. the owner of the goods provided he makes the he is a consignee yes, yes. who the, who is the notify Who is the notify person? If you don't know, say don't know. I'll explain. No, no. Okay. Notify person is the person normally nominated by the consignee who will do the custom clearance. Understood. So that is the clearing and forwarding agent normally of the consignee. All right. Yes. Now, if if you have already consigned the goods to an importer, all right. Now, if importer somehow goes to the shipping company and says that, look, goods are consigned to me. Here is my ID. But the original bill of lading has been lost in transit. You give me the delivery. All that the shipping company will say is, okay, you give me some guarantee that tomorrow, if there is a claim on the shipping company, then I will revoke that guarantee that you are giving. That's all the shipping company will do. Okay. And they'll give delivery of the goods because it is already consigned to an actual legal entity. Yes. Now, there are lots of stories I have to share of risks in documentation, which we'll continue in the next lecture. It's, 10, it's 9 o'clock your time. Yes. We'll call it a day. But we'll come back to this. You give me the next slot. I'm very happy because this subject is taught very well on Zoom sessions. But I want you to understand the nitty-gritties and complexities of the subject because, as I said, if India has to reach $2 trillion, which it will in exports, and if you empower yourself in documentation, you will be creating an immense competency, a tremendous competency for growing in any organization. All right? India, for sure. Internationally, definitely. All right? And there is a dearth of people. There is shortage of people who have the right kind of competencies and eye for details to mitigate the risks that are in transportation of goods and documentation. Okay, The bill of lading is a very, very important thing. And I will be sharing with you some videos, Okay, which I will encourage you to go through and come prepared in the next session. All right? Any questions? You never have questions, so I'm not going to waste your and my time. So, let's call it a day. All right? We can end? Uh, and yeah. make the recording available to all, Anaga. And uh, yes. All the recordings, I'll encourage you to put, give me on a USB drive. I'll oh, pay for the drive. So oh, yes, sir. Yes. Use it later. Yeah? Yes, yes. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Okay.